Well, greetings, everyone. Uh, I'm Jim Edmondson. I'm chief curator of the Dittrich Museum, and I'm really pleased to have you here to attend the sixth annual Percy Sky Lecture on the History of Contraception. Um, I want to, first of all, make a point to introduce Percy himself, because he's the one that's responsible for us holding this meeting. Percy, would you please either stand up or raise your hand? Percy. <laughs> I, I can say that uh, I first saw Percy's collection in Toronto, I think in 1996, at a factory where it was displayed, and I thought it was quirky and interesting, uh, but I had no idea that we might become home to it. And then in 2003, uh, Percy was contemplating retirement, the company was moving different directions, and he decided he needed to find a new home for that collection. He narrowed it down to three places, a museum in Philadelphia, a museum in DC, and the Dittrich Museum here in Cleveland and it made a site visit to each place. And I guess we won that talent contest because it's here now. Uh, but I think he was particularly moved by the fact that we are an educational institution. It's not that the others didn't have education in their mission, but they weren't as purely educational as we are. Um, additionally, he found Cleveland to be a congenial place, and the others were a bit more bureaucratic, and so that was a good thing. But I think most importantly, he found that there was a strong enthusiasm on the ground here. So when we articulated the idea of why we should become home to the collection, we had people in our own community who could be part of the team to, to express our position. And uh, it's been great. I think uh, the lecture is a validation of his selection of Cleveland as a home for this collection. Um, we got the gallery open and running in 2009, and shortly after that, he asked me, what, what more can I do? And I said, well, we would love to be able to have a lecture each year, and he said that he would endow it. And so in, in perpetuity, or for as long as the institution of the Dittrich Museum lasts, so too will this lecture. And I'm going to turn, at this point, the in introduction over to Jesse Hill, who will give us a bit more background on our speaker. Thanks very much. Thank you. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce Iris E. Harvey, who is the president and CEO of Planned Parenthood of Greater Ohio and Planned Parenthood Advocates of Ohio and this year's Percy Sky Lecturer. Ms. Harvey has served in her current role at Planned Parenthood since April of 2016. She also served on the uh, Planned Parenthood of Greater Ohio Board of Directors since 2011 and was board chair in 2015. In addition to her longstanding relationship with Planned Parenthood, Iris Harvey has tremendous experience in leadership in both the public and private sectors. She came to Planned Parenthood from Kent State University, where she was vice president for university relations. And before that, she was vice president for marketing and communications at Wright State University. Um, her private sector experience includes vice president positions at Citigroup, as well as CEO of Market Strategies and Solutions, Inc., a consulting firm she founded and operated for seven years while living in Japan. Although she's a native of New Jersey and has lived all over the world, uh, Ms. Harvey has lived in Ohio for a decade. Her volunteer service includes board membership with a diverse group of nonprofit organizations, including Summa Health Foundation and Area Agency on Aging, um, Direction Home, Akron Canton. Um, she's also a member of the National Planned Parenthood Federation of America Board of Directors. For her leadership and service, she's had numerous awards and recognition, including as a woman of note, recognized as a woman of note by Cleveland Cranes, and a woman of power uh, by Akron Urban League. Um, Ms. Harvey is also a Fulbright Scholar and a Ford Foundation Scholar, and she earned her um, bachelor's degree and her MBA um, in business administration from the University of Southern California, and she also holds an education degree from George Washington University. I can also say personally that I've had the opportunity to hear Ms. Harvey speak on a few occasions, and it is always a treat. She's a passionate and eloquent defender of reproductive rights. Despite relentless attacks at both the state and national level, Ms. Harvey ensures that Planned Parenthood of Greater Ohio continues to advance its mission of providing excellent, compassionate, non-judgmental reproductive health care to patients 
and empowering women to make the right healthcare decisions for themselves and their families. So please join me in welcoming her to the podium tonight. materials up here. Can you hear me? Great. Well, thank you, Jesse. She is one of my heroes because I remember one of my first board meetings, she came in and gave us just this incredible landscape of the legal area of reproductive health. And she's been a partner with us uh, for the last decade, and often when we have to defend ourselves, and we have many lawyers on the phone, we can always count on Jesse to be there with us. So thank you very much. Yeah, you know, I was thinking about um, abstinence, and I remember when I was a kid, my mom used to say to me, you know, absence makes the heart grow fonder. And in retrospect, while I was writing this uh, talk, I was wondering if she meant something else. She also used to tell me, you know, keep your skirt down, your knees closed, and your hands out of your pocket, and you won't get into any trouble. I never quite understood what the pocket thing was about. But, you know, she had her own way of doing things before we actually got to uh, really talk about sexual education. So I'd like to talk um, and put some context to my talk. Abstinence is a controversial word very often, and there is no universal definition for it. So from a health professional standpoint, we see it in one way, and from a public policy and government standpoint, there's another lens. So as health professionals, we see abstinence as a behavioral issue, such as postponing sex, or never having sex, or refraining from sexual intercourse, or abstaining from touching, kissing, manual masturbation, anal, or oral sex. These are all behaviors. But on the public policy and government side, what you will see as you look at the re legislation, you look at the literature, that it is all about um, morals, so abstinence in terms of moral terms, to be chaste, to be a virgin, or attitudinal, to make a commitment such as the virginity pledge, and being responsible such as personal responsibility. And then there's also character and morality based on specific region or moral issues. So today, I'm going to focus a lot on public policy and funding to put in context uh, a view on abstinence only until marriage. And so I know this is a bit of a chart, but I wanted to give you quickly a snapshot. <laughs> uh, I'll walk you through it. So abstinence only until marriage was first introduced in legislation in 1981 with the passing of a bill called the Adolescence Family, uh, Family Life Act and was known by its nickname as the Chastity Law. And it was written with the elements of a specific uh, reproductive health uh, proposition of there being only one acceptable form of family planning, and it, it followed the rules of a specific religion uh, in, uh, in the US. Uh, that followed in 1985 uh, because it really did involve and the grants were given to religious organization. There was a test of it in the court and it was ruled unconstitutional. But it continued on and the ACLU filed a suit on the basis of there not being a separation of state and religion. Uh, however, the Supreme Court ruled against it and said that religious organizations can receive money for non-religious programming. And so it has existed since then. And I want to give you just a sense of the, the last um, maybe 35 years and the context. So um, under Bill Clinton's administration, abstinence only uh, until marriage continued on and it was included in the Welfare Act bill. And even the 1981 and this 1996 bill was included without there being any hearings or, or, or floor vote. Um, this focus was on teen pregnancy, chastity, postponing sex until marriage. Under the Bush administration, we had sort of a two-fold push. Uh, abstinence until marriage uh, was promoted for everyone and it introduced an eight-point uh, guidance criteria, and I will share that with you in just a minute. Uh, when the, the 
responsibility was moved over into the Department of Health and Human Services, there were more restrictions put on it and a narrowing of the scope. So there was still the eight point criteria, but now all of the elements of them had to be taught in any sexual education class. Uh, equally, and the focus was very specific. The focus now targeted children as young as 12 years old and young adults as old as 29 years old, abstinence only till married. Some of you out here have probably been doing something they don't want you to do. <laughs> So um, the funding continued, and uh, with the Obama administration, it moved to, uh, he uh, looked at the program, and he started funding a comprehensive sex education program, and one of the programs he introduced was the Teen Par Pregnancy Protection Program. And the differentiation between the, the two is that most of the abstinence only uh, until marriage is not necessarily evidence-based or scientific or factual even, and uh, the whole uh, teen pregnancy protection program was designed for comprehensive sex education to be evidence-based and for there to be funding to organizations that uh, that did do that. So over this period of time, we've seen the federal government spend nearly $2 billion on this policy with million more, millions of more dollars being um, matched by the states because from one year to the other, they needed to either match every dollar with $3 or um, every dollar with $4. So that's uh, an overview of where we are and these laws uh, still continue. So what exactly is abstinence only into a married program? Let me tell you the eight point criteria. And, and they're mandated, and again, they target uh, children from 12 years old to young adults to 29 years old. And the first and most important is obviously, exclusively teach the social, psychological, and health games from abstinence. Also meaningfully teach abstinence from sexual activity, uh, make sure that it's understood that sexual activity outside of the frame of marriage um, is, is not expected and that the expected behavior is that you wait until you're married. Um, that abstinence is the only way to avoid unmarried pregnancy and STIs and you could debate the factuality of that, and that mutually faithful monogamous, monogamous marriage is the only context for sex. So you can also see, given this time, who's excluded in terms of being considered someone who should get good factual and medically accurate um, information. It also said that um, out, sex outside of marriage is likely to be mentally and physically harmful. That's part of what you should teach. And then out of wedlock, out of wedlock children, stigmatizing the child, um, will mean that there'll be harmful consequences to the child, the family, and society. Last, um, second to last, youth must re reject sexual advances that are triggered by alcohol and drug, and I think uh, none of us could uh, disagree with that. And then this last one, students should um, attain self-sufficiency before having sex, and that means that they should graduate from high school, they should get a job, they should get married, and that's the order before they have sex. So other things that are real important to know about abstinence only until marriage is that educators are not permitted to teach the use of condoms um, for protection or to discuss contracepti contraceptives to prevent pregnancy, pregnancy, except to stress their failure rate. So if a birth control pill is 98% effective, they can only talk about the 2% failure, and they can say if you have an H HIV, you can prevent it maybe by using a condom, but uh, there can be no further conversation on how you might use a condom, exactly how you might uh, put it on. Another thing that is uh, very troubling is that many of the state and federal programs do not require that the lessons be medically accurate, which I think is an issue of um, ethics here. So 
Um, why is it important to know the facts about this? Um, it's important because these policies and funding are changing U.S. education. Comprehensive sexual, sexuality education has essentially been eroded. Instruction in human sexuality has dropped from 67% in 2000 to 48% in 2014. Instruction about HIV prevention has declined from 64% to 41% in the same period. And by 2014, 50 50% of middle school students and junior high school students and 76% of high school students were taught that abstinence is the only way to avoid pregnancy, HIV, and STDs. And so you've got a framework here that uh, is troubling in terms of what is the choice that a student will have, what is the accurate and medically sound information that they will receive. And so my premise today is that abstinence only until marriage programs are inappropriate mandates for public school education. I believe that abstinence is a great sexual behavior for any young person to have or anybody who wishes to have it, but it needs to be in the context of fully understanding how you function as an individual and also what your options are. The programs are not scientific or evidence-based. They're ineffective in changing behavior, and I'll spend some time showing you the evidence of that later. They're misleading. Because of that, they are also possibly harmful. They're coercive. If you think about some LGBTQ students and the uh, inference and the stigmatizing that they get in class, and it's possibly by health professional standards unethical. So we've talked a lot about abstinence, but really we're here to talk about sex, right? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, listening to an old buzzard like myself is all right, but I'd like you to listen to someone and two people. These are peer educators. I do believe that we should learn about contraception and condoms early on because birth control can be used for a number of things, not just preventing pregnancy. It can be, you can help your acne, it can help your cramps. People who are taught abstinence, I still think they should know how to use a condom or use contraception because there may be a day where you do break that and then it just, you need to be prepared because it's your body and you need, you should know how your body works. Personally, I believe that abstinence is amazing, but if you don't want to be abstinent, don't be abstinent, but be safe. But it's your choice to make. It's not your parents, it's not your religions. It's your choice to make. In most families, as we're growing up, it's taught that sex is bad, wait till marriage. Sex is naughty, sex is taboo. And so when a student or a child or anyone has sex, they're scared. They're very scared. They don't know what to do. It's always awkward. And that's why I think we do need more education on it. They're always like scared. Do I use a condom? Do I not use a condom? How do I use a condom? What if I get an STD? What if I get pregnant? What if this, that, and this? So in today's environment, about uh, students on the average age of beginning sexual intercourse is about 17 years. And so they're pretty much um, uh, young adults. But we also know that among high school students, about 41% have had a sexual intercourse, uh, and that 30% of them have had it within the last three months. And what is troubling about either of those numbers, I think, is not so much that they've had sex, but also that 43% uh, did not use a condom the last time they had sex, and that 14% did not use any method to prevent pregnancy. So they're not necessary, many of them are not necessary necessarily practicing safe sex, and they are not practicing sex that will prevent an unplanned and unwanted pregnancy. So that's problematic. And regardless of what you want young people to do, you also have to make sure that they can do the right thing when they maybe do something that we don't anticipate. So when we look at the overall landscape, we see that nine out of 10 pregnancies among young women, 15 to 19 years old, are unintended. About 50% of pregnancies in the United States are unplanned and unintended. So that means on average you have about 8,000 pregnancies per year among young women. And those um, are unplanned because they could have been using contraceptive and they didn't use it correctly, 
or they weren't using it. So there are a variety of ways. Um, when you look at this, what does this mean? It, it means that a teen having a child has a cost. It has a social cost. And for taxpayers, it's about $9.4 billion annually uh, for a teen that requires, and the many teens that do require uh, public assistance and uh, security. And so we'll look at that number a little bit more. Now, the Cost to us as a taxpayer is significant, right? And it's not something that we should ignore. But we're really talking about human beings. We're talking about young, developing people. And so what is the impact on them? Well, let's look at this. 30% of teen girls who have dropped out of high school cite that they've dropped out because of pregnancy or a planned parent, uh, sorry, they've dropped out because of pregnancy or parenthood. So pregnant teenage girls who drop out of high school are at risk. Where do they go? How do they finish their education? And what we've seen is that we know that less than half get a high school graduation, um, but we also know that less than 2% of them who've had a child before age 18 obtain a college degree by age 30. Think about this. These young women are really stuck in a cycle of, of poverty and few, uh, few options for their future. Now, here's another story, because this is why it's so important to make the information that these teens get very rich, is that about one in five teens who is given birth will also have a repeat birth. So you're looking at not just one repeat birth, but two and three. And so that's about 183 repeat births to teens on any one day. And if you think that this is um, not possible, I want you to, to, and that it doesn't happen in these days, I like to tell the story of Evelyn and Bill. So Evelyn and Bill were two 14-year-old kids that had unprotected sex. And they got, she got pregnant. And they had a baby. She had a baby, a baby girl at 15 years old. She was an adorable baby girl. I know she was adorable because she was my mother. Evelyn and Bill were my grandparents. And that should have been the end of that story. They got married, their families were shamed, but they got married, they had a baby girl. But she left the hospital without any information about contraceptives, without any information about family planning. And this is the story. 11 months later, she was back in the hospital having a second child. My grandmother, having her second child at 16 years old, died in a hospital delivery room. She left a husband with two infants under a year. He also was not a high school graduate, an African-American man, and you can imagine many decades ago, what was his future? And we're looking at this same type of situation today. And if we're not looking at how you change that formula, then that to me is problematic. So teen mothers, we talk about they, they're having few future career opportunities. Uh, we know that without a high school education, there are very few opportunities for you in a career path. Now we're looking at post high school to get a good job and some college. We also know that teens who have had a child and remain unmarried for most of their lives uh, without a high school education, without some type of college, they stay in poverty. So if you look at these uh, burgundy lines, you can see that an unmarried female household with a related child under 18 years old, 49% of them live in poverty. And that's a statistics that's painful and one that we want to make sure that at every turn in our society, we can prevent that type of happening. There are also racial, racial, race, racial and gender inequities, um, gender identities that are inequities in our society that need to be addressed. And let's look at a few of them. So unintended pregnancy rates among black and Latinx women have been over two times higher than among white women. So if you look at the pregnancies per 1,000, white women is at 33, Latinx women, and that's the new term, 
case many of you are thinking it's Latino, uh, are 58, and black is 79. Now, I'd like to draw a reference that I bet you if we laid out infant mortality rates and maternal deaths, you'd see the same type of disparity by race. So this is an issue, these are social determinants of health in this country that we have to address. And abstinence only until marriage is not one that necessarily helps us to look at these things. Unintended pregnancy rates for women with incomes lower than $12,000, $12,000 is about um, the federal poverty level, um, have been six times higher than for those with incomes of about $24,000, and $24,000 is only 200% of the federal poverty line. So again, you see this continue, continued um, relationship between income and unintended pregnancies. And something that you can see the vast degree of difference by income when you look at this chart. So at uh, be below 100% of the poverty line, it's 51. But when you start getting income into a family and to a woman, you can see that the pregnancy rates start to, unintended pregnancy rates start to drop. And a lot of that has to do with the access to contraception, the education, and the lifestyle that they're able to live because of a higher income level. We also know that LB, LGBTQ young students have a very hard time in school and that they are more likely to report school incidents than their heterosexual students. So they're more likely to be physically forced, forced to have sex. We call that rape at Planned Parenthood. They experience sexual dating violence at a greater rate. They experience physical dating violence. They're bullied in school and online. And a school sex program that totally focuses on heterosexual marriage is not one that welcomes them and is not one that is inclusive of their needs in, in school. Uh, this is another statistic that's really important. In 2015, young, youth age 13 to 24 accounted for 22% of all new HIV diagnoses in the U.S. And most of those new diagnoses among young people, 81%, occurred among gay and bisexual males. And again, if you look at the chart, you can see the relationship by race as well, poverty and race as being factors that are also pushing people into unhealthy areas. Now, that's at a national level, and so we're here in Ohio, right? So I want to make sure that we look at what Ohio looks like specifically. So first, Ohio is an abstinence only until marriage state. And you can see uh, by the uh, grading of colors here that it is at the highest level. Abstinence is stressed. And this is based on information that is available on the Department of um, Health. Uh, and it, all of the blue states are what we would call not so good in terms of uh, this uh, policy. So in Ohio, uh, the, they promote, we promote abstinence only until married. It mandates sex education, but only specifies abstinence only. And there's no curriculum on sex education in our schools. There's no requirement of who teaches sex education. And there is no specification for anything more than maybe two hours. So you add that to a curriculum that is wanting in facts and wanting in empathy for the students that it's teaching, and you have a formula for high risk. It also mandates HIV, but as we know, it tells you very much, very little about the behavior and using condoms. So how good is that? And those rates suggest that. It also does not require education to be medically accurate, age appropriate, or culturally appropriate and unbiased, and it does allow for promotion of religion. So this is another way of looking at Ohio. Let's look at it in the context of the United States. And for those of you who may be uh, geography challenged as I often am, that's us there with the little uh, red arrow. And, and here you can see again that, the, that what this represents is that the percentage of total pregnancies which are unintended, we're at the high level of the chart, 60% of our pregnancies 
are unintended in Ohio. So it's something that needs to be addressed. If we also add um, the elements of income and teen birth rate and the abstinence only, you can see again that we are, and again, we are the, the crosshairs where the sort of fence-like uh, depiction is uh, the combination of abstinence only and low income under $46,000, which is the medium uh, US income. And then the darker the color is the degree to which uh, the girls 15 to 19 have a birth rate. And again, we are in one of the dark blue zones. And I'd like to point out something else here. And most of these charts, you see another commonality of where we're most like. We're very much like the southern states. And if you know anything about healthcare in the southern states, it's not very good. And so when we look at ourselves in parity to other um, parts of our country, we're not doing a great job. Sex education laws in Ohio um, that relate to sexual orientation and gender identity. In Ohio, as in most states, there is no guidance on it. We do have several cities in Ohio that have guidance. But generally, again, whoever walks into that class, classroom with whatever curriculum that they have, they can teach what they want. And among 15 and 24, 15 to 24 years old, what we're also seeing is that they are not practicing safe sex to a great degree. So let's look at that. So 15 to 24 year olds in Ohio represent about 14% of the population. But as you can see in this chart, they represent 74% of chlamydia infections and 62% of gonorrhea inf infections. Essentially, young people in our state are getting sexually transmitted infections at a higher rate than anybody else, and it's a major problem. And if you look at it by gender, females 15 to 24 have had infections at three to four times the rate of males in the same group. So what is going on? What is the information? And if abstinence until marriage is working, why are we seeing these types of numbers? So I think that it's always good to, again, look at how do we compare to the rest of the states. And so again, here's my little chart. You see the red arrow. And again, we're at the high end of poor performance. And we mirror, again, states that are not known for having good health care. So this is gonorrhea, and this is chlamydia. So what works versus what doesn't? So we're gonna talk about evidence-based research on comprehensive sex education versus abstinence only until marriage. So what is comprehensive sex education? That's what we've started seeing introduced in 2010 through the Teen Pregnancy Prevention Program. And it's, it's very simple. It's that it's education that is high quality teaching and learning. You need the combination of good teachers and putting it in the type of context, experiential learning practice, so that students can learn. And it's about a broad variety of topics related to sex, sexuality, exploring values and beliefs about those topics, and gaining the skills that are needed to navigate relationships and to manage one's own sexual health. That doesn't sound so threatening to me, but I guess to others it might. The key concepts that are covered in comprehensive sex education are basic, human development. Teens are humans. Why should we not teach them about who they are and how they develop? About relationships. Teens have relationships with many people. They have relationships with their parents, with their teachers, with their other loved ones, with their siblings, and with their classmates. And in learning to manage those relationships, they grow. We also teach them personal skills when we talk about how to get consent, how to um, express yourself appropriately, whether it's with your classmate or with your parents so that you're better understood and that you can articulate your need. We also teach about sexual behavior, sexual health, and society and culture because no child lives just in their own life and just with their own home. Topics that are usually discussed are reproductive system, 
Everybody has a body, right? Body image, we know that teenagers are very concerned with, you know, multiple parts of their bodies. Uh, you know, big boobs, is that good, is that bad? Is I, should I have it at 10 or, or what? Um, gender identity, friendships, communication, sexual abstinence, contraception, and decision making. These are all topics that any of us need to know, all of us use throughout our lives, and there's no reason to deny young people this type of information. So let's hear what our teens say again. I think teens think that sex is like, I don't wanna say the cool thing to do, but teens think that everybody has sex, but nobody knows the things that come with having sex. Like you can get an STD, you can have like, you can have a disease for the rest of your life by just having sex one time or coming into contact with an infected person. I do think teens have a lot of misinformation. I think it, a lot of it comes from the type of sexual education that they've received from middle school through high school and the type of sexual education that they are receiving, whether it's abstinence or other types. The misinformation is wild. <laughs> There's so much misinformation. It's funny because I'll hear adults say that's something they should teach at homes, but they never teach it at homes. So, you know, kids resort to their phones and Sure, there's a lot of great information on there, but there's also a lot of false information. And it's kind of scary because, you know, my friend heard that if he peed in someone, he'd get them pregnant. <laughs> we should be teaching students more so that they don't make fatal mistakes. So, you know, the question is, when we're talking about teens, who are their best allies? Who are the people that are most responsible for them? Who are the people that love them more than anything in this earth? They're their parents. And believe it or not, parents support comprehensive sex education. And why? Because it works. So let's see what parents think. So parents in middle school believe that abstinence, as do I, and I think most people should be a behavior that's taught, but they also equally believe that teaching about sexual or transmitted infections, puberty, healthy relationships, contraception, and sexual orientation should be taught in the middle school. Look what this looks like when it goes into um, high school. They, they all are aligned with believing that these are topics that their students should learn. Now, at least you think, okay, this is probably political. Some people won't based on their voting and some people won't. What we found is that across political ideologies, parents have the same interests. They all, to a large extent, you know, 80 to 90 percent, believe that abstinence, abstinence should be taught in middle school and high school. Okay, that's no surprise, right? But look at contraceptive methods. They have an equally interest in having their students learn about it, middle school and high school, and sexual orientation, not as great of an interest, but nevertheless, one that would suggest that parents have an interest. And so why are their children not getting this type of education? So there are organizations that also support comprehensive education, and it is not surprising that they're mostly medical organizations. There are hundreds of them, but these are some of the few uh, that uh, make sense to highlight because they understand not only child development, but they're also responsible for helping them with their health care. So what evidence do we have that a comprehensive approach to sex education works? Well, we're seeing that teen pregnancies is on the decline, uh, and, and it's been quite, quite significant. Uh, we've seen a 35% decline in teen birth rates since 2010 and 2015. And I often get this question, well, if teen birth rates are dropping and unintended pregnancies are not being counted as much, what's happening with abortion? And these students that are where we see the decline is not because of abortion rates, because they are also declining at the same time. So what the research tells us is that the increased use of effective contraceptives contributes to a dramatic decline in teen pregnancies. So the birth rate declined rapidly between 2007 and 2013, dropping 36% among our 15 to 19 year olds. And there's also been a 25% decline in the adolescent pregnancy rate over a shorter period, falling from 70, uh, 
pregnancies to 52, and this is quite significant. And the use of abortion has not contributed to these declines, and it's important to, to understand that. And what does the data tell us? The data by many scientists and many studies many of them uh, consolidated in this, is that the rapid declines in adolescent pregnancy and birth rates from 2007 to 2012 can be contributed, attributed to increases in contraceptive use, including use of any method and multiple methods, I love that one, and multiple methods, and of more effective methods. Based on this and previous research, adolescent fertility declines since 1991 can primarily be attributed to improved contraceptive use. So if the scientists who are reading all of this, who are measuring all this, have said that the contributing factor is not abstinence only to marriage, but greater access to contraceptive, then why are we spending billions of dollars on something that has no science to it and is at best harmful to our students? It doesn't help their development. What do we know about the evidence of abstinence only until marriage? Well, there have been many rigorous studies, so let me tell you some of them. No scientific evidence suggests that the abstinence delays initiation of intercourse, reduces the number of partners, or facilitates secondary abstinence. The Department of Health and Human Services, which is where these programs are managed, found no impact on initiation of intercourse, numbers of partners, or behaviors. And the CDC study of 23 abstinence programs found no conclusions could be drawn on the effectiveness of group-based abstinence education. A review of 37 systematic reviews of school-based education concluded that abstinence-only interventions did not promote change in sexual initiation or other sexual behavior. And the U.S. House of Representatives reviewed many of the curriculums and they looked at 11 and found that 11 out of 13 contained false and misleading or distorted information about contraceptives effectiveness, the risks of abortion, and treated stereotypes about girls and boys as scientific fact and blurred religion and science. So the question is why you should be concerned about these public policies, and the way our government is teaching our students. It's quite simple. Abstinence is a good behavior, and it's a necessary part of sexual education. The controversy arrives when abstinence is provided to adolescents as a sole choice, and where health education and other choices is restricted or misrepresentative. Also, abstinence is theoretically fully effective but in actual practice, abstinence often, abstinence often fails to protect against pregnancy and STIs. And most Americans remain abstinent, few Americans remain abstinent until marriage. As a matter of fact, what they're finding is that most young women who took the virginity um, pledge fall off the wagon, so to speak. They do get married a little bit earlier than those who are active in sex, but they also had sex before they get married. So again, the behaviors haven't changed and the emphasis on marriage has not been successful. And although abstinence is a healthy behavior options for teens, abstinence as a sole option for adolescents is scientifically and ethically, pro ethically problematic. So look at who has done these studies. You've got medical professionals from Columbia University, Indiana University Medicine School, the Children's National Medical Center, Pediatrics um, Center, George Washington University, American College of Preventive Medicine, Mount Sinai Adolescent Health Center, Mount Sinai School of Medicine, Human Rights Watch. All of these organizations cannot be wrong about this program. So it's very important for us to take a strong look at what our children and learning are learning in class. So what is it that you can do? I think you first can talk to your teens about what they're learning in sex education. You can meet with your school's curriculum director and ask about the program that's being used for sex education. You can sit in on a class and see for yourself. You can review materials and lessons. 
You can also attend school board meetings and ask about evidence-based comprehensive sex education. You can talk honestly to teens about their sexual health, and you can let them know that there are no questions that they can ask that you aren't willing to consider and try and get the answer for. And for those of you who are having a little problem asking and answering some sexual questions, if you take some time at one point and you log on uh, to that uh, website there, you can see our tool on chat and text, and you can text a question on sex, and a trained live uh, sex educator, an adult in um, our headquarters, will answer you back and answer you medically accurate and factual. Thank you very much. So, I am happy to answer any questions. Let's see if I can find. I think I've lost my travel mic, but happy to stand here. Oh, she has the mic, okay. Yes, sir. It's hard to imagine there's going to be change about uh, government support of uh, appropriate sex education. Is that computer programs uh, re regarding sex education, at least some years ago when I was involved. And the question is, uh, what kinds of programs are available via uh, the web, the internet, in terms of appropriate sex education in the absence of appropriate government-supported sex education? Okay. Well, um, we do still have, and I'm not sure at what period of time uh, you're talking about, but if it was more than uh, three or four years ago, our um, inventory of information on sex education uh, for teens and for their parents and for different sexual orientation persuasion, there's a whole range of both videos um, and uh, actual digital learning tools where you can go in and think about. For instance, one of the things that we do with um, a patient who comes into our health center, we often ask them about their um, reproductive life plan. And that says, you know, wherever you are, let's say you're 17 years old, well, what are your plans? We really give a person a chance to talk about what they want to do, what their ambitions are. And based on that, we talk to them about what type of prevention might be best for them, what type of contraceptive would be um, best for them. And so there are tools online that also allow uh, a student to go in and ask questions and get answers. So the online environment can be very rich in getting information. It also can be very damaging. And we know that, um, I, you know, as I started uh, looking for some data, you put sex into your Google machine and you're going to get some really weird stuff that's going to come out of you. So, um, you know, pornography is wild. And so we want students to be able to access information, but they also need to go to safe places. And there are many, you know, um, safe places. The, um, the national campaign for the national campaign for uh, teen uh, unintended pregnancy prevention. They have a very rich website. It's called the Web Bedsider. And again, there are videos, there are interactive tools where students can ask questions, where they can learn, and where they can feel as though uh, they're exploring and getting the information that they need. Okay. Are there any other questions? Yes, sir. Yes. You're absolutely right. The uh, one of the uh, highest 
incident rates in nursing homes is of ST, STIs. And so it is an area that is uh, largely ignored. But you're, you're right that this lifelong learning of how to manage your sexuality and how to protect yourself is, is very important. And right now the focus is on teens, but I do think it needs to be throughout our lifetime. Thank you for that question. Yes, ma'am. the significance of these social determinants of health, even within the same socioeconomic strata, do you feel like the provision of this evidence-based comprehensive sex education adequately accommodates those determinants, or do you recommend specific strategies that might more pointedly target some of those? Well, I... I it's not a cure-all, but it certainly does address some of them. So... Uh, a student who learns how to manage their sexuality, but also learns how to negotiate. We talk about human development, we talk about culture and society, uh, we talk about relationships. That student is more likely to be successful as they progress through their education to graduate from high school, to go on to college. So I do think it has a ripple effect. We can't expect sexual education to solve every issue, you know, in, in um, terms of inequities, but I think it's giving people a good start, a healthy start, and from there, we have to hold the rest of our society accountable for making sure that these things are happening. You know, I spent eight years as, um, at Kent State, and one of the things that uh, not necessarily that university, but I came very aware of as uh, the country started talking about sexual assault on campus. And sometimes you heard, you know, s some very bad situations about rape. You know, we we've heard them all over the country. And you also heard some sincere people saying, I thought that was yes. They really don't understand the concept. And the 17-year-old who graduates from high school with no good sexual education is the 18-year-old who comes on campus and now they have all these freedoms. They have no curfews, they have access to false IDs, they can get you know, alcohol any time of the day. Sex is free, and so I do think that that's something that we have to consider. It all has an impact um, on all cycles of life. So here's a question. Dr. Dixon, right? Now we're going to bring... teachers ever involved in this program and should they is the question I'm, I'm sorry is who involved male male teachers should male male teachers be involved in this program absolutely we have a lot of male teachers um, you saw one of our peer educators we have a we have a sex educator back here who is a male and uh, Because it can't, it, it can't just be about the girls, right? We get too much responsibility already. So yes, men and women and people of all persuasion need to be part of this because we are the human mosaic. And so when we exclude anybody, then that's problematic. Yes, ma'am. Oh, that's a good question. We, we've got a bunch of lawyers in the room, probably. But, you know, I'm going to ask, uh, Diego, is there anything, because we also have programs where we're invited into schools to uh, teach with um, uh, students and young people with disabilities. So do you want to speak to that? In fact, uh, there's no real, in the Ohio Revised Code, there is no um, prohibition for you to, to actually deliver sex education and truly... The, what you're doing with asking um, parental consent is great. I mean, you're covering yourself, so I, I don't see, and we do every time we go to schools, we ask for parental consent. Uh, some schools, it, uh, depending on the school, some schools ask that beforehand as an opt-in um, option, and some of the other schools use it as an uh, opt-out um, option to it. Okay, one more question. Hi, um, I work as an evaluator of the um, TPP 
grant that was granted to the Cuyahoga County Board of Health that's been in, practice, uh, been in place since 2015. And that is one of those of uh, the more than 80 that were cut um, prematurely by two years. Um, one of the large uh, Health and Human Services grants through the Office of Adolescent Health. So these are programs that are basically um, evidence-based, spe uh, specific to, um, targeted towards specific populations that are most in need. And we serve seven inner ring Cleveland, uh, Cuyahoga County uh, school districts. And so we've been cut by two years, which is a problem because oftentimes these are in schools that aren't getting any other form of sexual education, middle school through high school. And so I thought it was interesting, there was a comment about um, how do we make sure that like these uh, comprehensive programs are really serving the populations and meeting those social determinants of health. And because these are also funded through for research, um, you're looking at how they are um, making an impact. And because this has been cut prematurely, you're really losing a lot of data about how to best serve those communities. So I guess my question is, how do you see a way to keep building on that body of evidence without continued national funding at that level? Because we've lost 80 programs that were doing this work. Let me um, first sort of shorten it and uh, make sure that the audience uh, understands. So the teen pregnancy prevention programs are uh, primarily funded under Title 10, which is the National Family Planning Program. And uh, those funds at the, have been um, cut back. And in 2017, all of us who participate in those evidence-based programs were told that there's a new formula for uh, dis dis to awarding grants. And those formulas include uh, going to uh, s providers who only provide one form of contraception uh, to uh, crisis pregnancy centers and to people who don't perform evidence-based. And so I think the answer to your question is, is that we have to be engaged, we have to let the administration, our Congress people, and the agencies know that we are not happy, that we will not allow this to happen. And, you know, I'm from Planned Parenthood, so we always say loud and proud. But I think you have to make your presence known and uh, not be willing to let's just let the cuts happen. So. Thank you. I know that was the last question. I'd like to also thank the Mount Sinai Foundation. They've allowed us to do a lot of the research that we do. We're building a new plan with a focus on comprehensive sex education to make sure that our schools and our students get the type of education that they need in this area. So thank you, Dan.